Well, Dave, here we are in 2014, and uh, earlier this year you became a 50-year member of the CYC. How did you get involved with the club initially? Well, it was through sailing, Peter. Uh, the grandfather had a power boat. When he died, uh, my father and his two brothers decided they didn't want a power boat. They wanted a yacht to go cruising in. And they approached Peter Allen Payne, and he came up with a 41-foot design built out of steel, which took us two and a half years, I think, of working every weekend to complete this boat and get it in the water. And then in 1961, we did our first little adventure down to Hobart. And, uh, and this boat was Silver Six, is that right? Yeah, Silver Six, yeah. 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 And uh, that was the first time I'd ever seen a line squall. And they're rather amazing when you see them for the first time. This one was 70 miles long, but we were lucky we were right on the western edge of it. Could I just interrupt then, but just go back a step. Had you sailed skiffs or anything prior to sailing? Oh, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. The father had built us a, uh, an 18 foot up, a Fox design, uh, which we could go out and sail around the harbour and beat the 18 footers. And we put trapezes on it as well. And it was quite an adventure sailing, that thing. Yeah, we, had to, we actually sailed it from uh, Sydney to Lake Macquarie one time. So it was an open boat or was it or balanced? No, it was closed it? in, closed right. in there okay. with just a little set up right. top to put your feet in. But any ballast? Did it have a ballast? No, 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 no ballast. Right. But, right. Uh, they were taking the, uh, the 60 foot Albertson cruiser up there and uh, the Barry and I, the brother and I convinced Dad that we could sail up there. Uh, the only problem was that the power boat cruised at 10 knots and we left them for dead. So <laughs> they got a bit worried. <laughs> they found us tied up the bridge of Swansea. <laughs> Great story. So anyway, sorry, I interrupted then about Silk and the first Hobart in 61, yeah, yeah, yeah. the line school. Yeah. yeah, but that was, you know, like, that was the introduction to it and then yeah. we just kept going. Yes. We built the boat to go cruising but never cruised. Yeah. And where was it built? We built it in the yard in Crown Street. We had a, a plumbing business in there with the yard and we actually built it. And uh, one of the interesting things about that was we built it facing north and south. Oh, sorry, east and west. And when we actually finished it and put the tape measures around, it was a lot longer on the starboard side than it was on the port side where the sun had been shining on it all the time with the expansion and contraction. <laughs> all sorts of funny stories like that. <laughs> so did it get be go better on one tap than the other? <laughs> well, as you asked me the other day, what did it do at three knots to windward and left over seaway? And I, as I told you, it went backwards. <laughs> so it wasn't a lightweight flyer, obviously. No. <laughs> Built for comfort, yeah. We could win a cup Gucci race when it blew 30 knots and we carried the four main and the number one headsaw. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But, you know, it's a great solid boat and a lot of memories, oh, I guess, yeah, for you. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Lots of memories, you yeah. know, like uh, 61 was all right, apart from that light school. 62 was not so bad, and then we came to the 63 race. And uh, as I said, it wasn't a light weather prior. <laughs> <laughs> and we ended up, we must have been about 150 miles east of Flinders Island when it came to blow 70 knots from the southwest, uh, There were 10 other boats out there with us. We were the only ones that ended up in Hobart. They all turned around and ran back to Sydney. But it took us, you know, a long while and we actually got into the coast and we actually ducked in behind Mariah Island to have a rest. And I had one, seam, one member of the crew was, had appendicitis so we jumped onto a trawler to go ashore. <laughs> You've heard these stories before. Well, but let's hear them. They're fantastic. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But the funny part about it was the little silver goose and all that, and a van is that design boat. It was actually leaving as we got in behind Mariah Island. We spent about six or seven hours in there just playing around and having a bit of a rest. And then we set off and uh, we actually passed. Zorbergeist at Tasman Island, 
they were trying to get around, they couldn't get around it. We beat them home, I think, by about three hours after giving them a six hour start. <laughs> Is that the year that it recorded 70 odd plus knots at Tasman? That, 82, that I think. 82, was it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, it's. A lot uh, of you remember, Pete, we used to work on a seven year cycle yes. with the winds like yeah. 56, 63. Yeah. Yeah, then I got caught in 70, yeah. then I got caught in 77, then I got caught in 84. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and then it went wrong. It yes. was supposed to be 91, but it turned out 93. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But um, in the early Sylph days, I mean, you had a lot of characters sailing with you. One of, of course, one of the great characters of this club in the Sydney Hobart race was Tony Cable. Was that his first Hobart on Sylph? I think it was, wasn't it? No, or he tried to do oh, with Tarnie. Previous, previous year with Tarnie. Tarnie with Jeff. They blew up the roller rigging as they went out. That's oh, right. These days, no one would understand what roller, roller rigging, rigging was. Yeah, but yeah. They blew that up going out through the head, yeah. so they had to retire. Yeah, so he completed his first Hobart race with you on Sylph. On Sylph, yeah, 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 yeah. What was he like in those days? Any different to what he is today? No. <laughs> <laughs> Tell all here, it's a tell all story. Right, the funny, funniest story we ever had with him was one Saturday race we were doing a, a Coogee race, that's when we used to race around the boys at Coogee. And he walked along the wharf and he stopped and he looked at the boat and he was sick before he got on it. He'd had a big diet the night before. So nothing's changed then? No, really. mate, nothing's <laughs> changed in 50 years. <laughs> oh, yeah. mate, I've had a lot of fun with him over all those years. Yeah, great character. Yeah. You know, and what, uh, what about other characters in, that, in the 60s? I mean, I, I referred, I was talking to Rob McCauley, we were doing an interview with Rob a few months ago, and I, I sort of call it the swashbuckler year. Of the year oh. You know, they were great characters, partied hard, sailed hard, and, and great camaraderie. And, you know, we're all friends still today, aren't we? I mean, yeah, oh, yeah. What other characters were around then? I mean, always Mickleborough comes up, but there, there are other people. Mickleborough's well. there all the time, yeah, mate, yeah, you know, but yeah. the, you know, the Ron Coddies and the yeah. Jimmy McLarens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jimmy McCloy, as we used to call, Nude Nut, and, yeah. and yeah. Alan Campbell was, yeah. Alan Campbell did that race to Hobart with us on the silk. Yeah. I think that was 64. Billy Manning, did he sail with you? Bill Manning, yeah, well, he was on that 63. Rossi, yeah. 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 But, uh, Made a lot of characters around the place in those days. Yeah. And as you said, they all played hard and they sailed hard. Yeah. yeah, you couldn't wait to get to Hobart to stay for a week and have a drink, could you? Well, you know, it took me a long while. It took me 33 years to wake up. It was a very hard way to get to a very good party at the other end. <laughs> but you blokes these days don't have parties at the other end. You get there and fly home. Yeah, home as quick as you get there, yes. Yeah. So, so you progress with Sylph and then. Um, you mentioned 1970, which is another hard race, and I remember being in Constitution Dock when Fairly Well came in, and you sailed on Fairly Well yeah. with Cable, I think, and you, you broke your steering. That was a hard race. Pasha won it overall. Yeah, yeah. Hard sou-easter race leading across the strait and down the Tassie Coast. Yeah, well, that was you, Sutherland, it was a class. Yeah, Sutherland, Sutherland yeah, lasted yeah. for 50 hours, yeah, you know, yeah. that we broke the steering. It must have been after the Southerly, because we were running hard with a spinnaker. Okay. And Cable was actually steering, and she was a very hard boat to steer downhill. And Cable all of a sudden just spun the wheel. Look at this, look at this, look at this. We all waited for the Chinese jive, but she just did this gentle brooch and fell on the side. She was a good boat, fairly well, Alan Payne. Yeah, was was Alan, that, that yeah. was Alan Payne's uh, answer to Freya. Yeah. Yes, yeah. It was basically, you know, Canoe stern like Freya was, yeah. and uh, very similar. But uh, no, it was a good boat. But Barney Davies, who was an engineer, and uh, um, he, as well as being an engineer, he was a magic chef, yeah. Yeah. unreal guy, another character. Yeah. He went down, and we broke the steering cables. So we had to put the emergency tiller in, which was something about this long. But we decided, you know, well, we can carry a spinnaker again. Well, <laughs> oh. <laughs> we just had no leverage on the thing, you know. She just fell over again. So from there on, it was pulled out head salt. I think Mike Fletcher was with you, was he? No, was Fletch, he? Fletcher. Fletcher had gone on to Mercedes, I think, in those oh, days. Right. But I remember you coming into Constitution Dock, 
I'd arrived before you, and Cable was up in the pulpit with the steering wheel. Fairs, please. Yeah, fairs, please. please. Steering with the Constitution. <laughs> oh, you were probably on the emergency tiller, yeah. But they're the memories, our characters. I mean, you're just they're not replicated oh, they, these days. Yeah. Well, we actually had a discussion about that. We had a few cluey guys on board the boat, and we looked at the, the table, saloon table, which was held up by a two-inch stainless steel pipe. And we decided we could take the, the binnacle out, the steering wheel off, shape the end of the tiller, the little two-foot one that we had, put this four-foot extension on it, and we'd have a tiller six foot long. Yeah. Well, we started talking to the owner about this. <laughs> he wasn't impressed at all. <laughs> Cutting his table up, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that was Jim Easton, wasn't it? Jimmy yeah. Easton, yeah. yeah. He was another character. Yeah, he was. He was. Yeah. Yeah. He loved life, that boat. He did. He did. Yeah. So, a couple of years later, you were um, on the mighty Helsel, the concrete footpath, 73. And yeah, uh, that, you, that boat for, designed by Joe Adams for Tony Fisher, Dr. Tony Fisher, built in concrete and um, set the Hobart record in 73. It was, that year was a run all the way, as I remember it. We put the spinnaker up at the heads and took it off in, almost at the iron pot, I think. In the, yeah, but I don't think anyone else had the pro problems we had. Tell us, about, tell us about this concrete boat. I mean, it was a massive boat, four characters. <laughs> 24 characters, yeah, mate. Yeah. Except for the owner, he was a bit serious. Yes. <laughs> but you had drama after drama, didn't you? Oh, yeah. yes. It, it's, uh, you know, we went very slowly down the harbour trying to keep out of everyone's way. And when we got out to sea, uh, Here's all these boats in front of us carrying shy spinnakers, and we tried to carry shy spinnaker. Now, what we didn't realise, once she got moving, she bent the apparent wind around so far that we couldn't <laughs> carry a shy spinnaker. Almost on a wind. <laughs> <laughs> this is something we were learning. You know, no one did sail on it. Because it was a massive boat, I can remember. See, it was massive <coughs> at the time, wasn't it? On the harbour, it dwarfed everything else. Well, it was 72 foot long, and had another bowsprit on it that yeah. went out about 8 feet. It was 20 foot wide. The amazing part about it was, it came at a 45 tonne, which on deed in those days weighed 45 tonne, and the keel hours weren't, you know, she was 42 tonne sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. So it, but it, it was an amazing boat, it wasn't like a concrete boat. Yeah. It, uh, but, you know, the mast was 96 foot. Uh, the biggest spinnaker was six and a half thousand square feet. It was a giant, the spinnaker piles were 36 foot long with handles on them, so you could, three blows would pick them up. <laughs> so you must have got your act together because, you, you know, the, the race, you know, turned into a beautiful nor'easter all the way and, you know, you were obviously oh, mate, to grips with the boat. We had spinnakers wrapped around the force day and, and, and one of the problems we had, in those days we didn't have bear claws, we only had parrot beaks on the spinnaker and we had wire braces, five eight diameter wire braces. And the braces kept popping out of the, the parrot beaks. And we couldn't work out what was going on until one of the, the Yank guys that was sailing with us, he lying on the on the deck with a pair of binoculars watching the wire. And as the load went on, the wire was unrolling. And out she popped. So it was opening the parrot beak. Opening the parrot beak. Yeah. Put the parapet upside down, don't you? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not that difficult. Apollo is way in front of us at this stage. Yeah. Keep yeah. on. <laughs> anyway, we set this pole upside down, running down the Tassie coast, and uh, by the lead because we didn't want to jive, you know. And I was steering, and not a lot of people wanted to have a steer. No, Lord, so you're going all right, you know. For about four and a half hours, I got this possibility. And we're getting down there, Tassie. And we decided, all right, we've got to drop the, drop the kite, stop it again, jive, put the kite up. And then we saw Apollo in front of us. Oh, we've got to jive. With the spinnaker up. The spinnaker up and the pole upside down. Right. 
think about it. Play the yeah, people. Probably reverse it, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got away with it. And we jive <laughs> and went around it. <coughs> and then we're carrying the shy kite. Freddie Thomas was steering. This day, and I said to Freddie, I said, mate, watch the bullets out of Port Arthur. Yeah, she's right, she's right, she's right. And then all of a sudden, whack, on our side. Get the spinnaker down. <coughs> so we got 22 blokes on sheets and bra lazy braces ready to gather it all in and fire the, the, the hand in. The boat came up right, sucked the spinnaker in behind the main and fell on top of 22 blokes on the deck. <laughs> but from then on we just sailed with cutter rigs across the bay, the storm bay, but I think from memory, from Tasman Island to the finishing line, we took something like three quarters of an hour out of Apollo. So you could imagine if, if everything had gone right all the way down. Yeah. We had no wind instruments, no speedo, no nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Yet you broke on Dean's record from 1962, didn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah. right. Yeah. But a lot of characters, I mean, you referred to, didn't Tony bring out some American maxi boat sails to sail on board? Or yeah, boat sails, yeah, we had Tommy Cornrut. Yeah, that's right, Tom. Yeah, yeah. Who we call Silver Side, because he had silver hair, remember that? Yeah, yeah. And then there was Diggy Todd. Yeah. Diggy Todd was a black with a long curly hair. Then we had two expats. Aussies, uh, Ian Moody and Lock Murray. And they were the only blokes that ever sailed on the Maxi before, and just as well we had them. So, you know, it was. But you had yeah, Freddie Thomas, I think Dickie Cores was with you, wasn't it? Dickie Dick Cores, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dickie Cores was with. Shields, uh, Graham Shields. Shields, he was yeah. with. Well, Shields, he built the mast. Oh, yeah, from All Spar yeah. those days, yeah, yeah Freddie. Yeah. Shields and I were called before the safety committee to see whether the boat was safe to go to Hobart. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. We just said, well, how do we know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, I said, I forget who was a safety bloke. I said, well, there's always Botany Bay and then there's Port Kembler and then there's Jarvis Bay. Yeah. Anyway, you wrote yourselves into history. No doubt about that. Yeah. But did you do other races? You did a few other uh, Hobarts on Helsel, did you? We went 74. Then, then we decided, or Tony decided he wanted to try and get the Melbourne Hobart record. So we did 75, we went to the Melbourne Hobart. Then 76, we broke the record in that race. But as we went across, out through the passage wall, through the entrance to Port Phillip, uh, we broke the main, we thought we broke the main habit, but it was blowing at a 70, or oh, sorry, a, a 35 knot southwester at this stage. And we just thought the had had broken. Anyway, there was a big discussion, you know, do we turn around and go back in and try and re-reeve a new had But why did you but, think it broke? Did the mainsail fall down? Oh, or? yeah, mainsail yeah, just right, came yeah, right. Yeah. But, uh, well, the it did break. But actually what happened was the turning sheet in the top of the mast exploded. We didn't know this at the time, but there was a, do we go back in and try and put a new halyard up and then start again? If we do that, we're going to only lose six hours because of the riptide down there. So we decided to go, keep going. We did the whole race with the station on the Spitfire jib until we got to the Briars, the southern end of Bruny Island, and we broke the record in that one. Without a mainsail? Without a mainsail. <laughs> <laughs> it's a colourful boat. Well, we, <laughs> we've actually put a spinnaker up alongside the Bruny Island by leading two spinnaker halyards around the cut shrouds. Sorry, yeah, and then we put the main up with two reefs in it. Right. Then we put a spinnaker up. Okay. Yeah. And the Sydney Hobart fleet all the one tonners and boats like that were just finishing and this thing comes tearing up the, the river. <laughs> 24 blokes yahoo <laughs> Right into daylight out of them. The flying footpath, yes. Yeah. Um, but we set and held every record on the east coast of Australia in that boat. Because you did a lot of northern races in there, yeah, 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 well, yeah. Sydney Mooloolaba, yeah. We, we did that, and that was the first time. 
anyone had ever averaged better than 10 knots for the race. We got there in 44 hours, 470 mile race. Yeah, yeah. And it was written up by Peter Campbell and everyone that we sailed in a southerly gale the whole way. We didn't. The last 150 miles, we never saw any breeze over 15 knots. Yeah, yeah. But there was a... In a lot of ways, that <coughs> the northern races are as uh, trickier in a certain extent than the Hobart, aren't they? I mean, with the current and the wind that's... I always liked the northern races <coughs> more than... Well, they were more of a challenge than me when I started navigating seriously. Uh, in those days, we didn't have all the, the equipment you've got these days and tell you to go offshore and do that. Uh, I think it would be interesting if you did the races like we used to do them around the Easter period, just to see what the weather routing would be like then, or weather routing, whatever yeah, they call yeah, it. Yeah, yes, yeah. And, and you know, but, but we learned, like if, in the 30 races I did going north, I think there was only one boat that went to sea and did any good. He went 30 miles due east of Sydney and came third on handicap. Yeah. But the rest of the time, if you tried to go to sea, 